moment you took everything that I own Everything you've given from heaven above and everything that I've ever known If you stripped away my ministry, my influence, my reputation My health, my happiness, my friends, my pride, and my expectation If you caused for me to suffer, or to suffer for the cause of the cross If the cost of my allegiance is prison and all my freedoms are lost If you take the breath from my lungs and make an end of my life If you take the most precious part of me and take my kids and my wife It would crush me, it would break me, it would suffocate and cause heartache I would taste a bitter dark providence, but you would still preserve my Hello, Moon Valley. We are continuing our sermon series titled Beyond Our Strength. It's a study through 2 Corinthians written by the Apostle Paul. And the text we're studying today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. And from this text, we're going to learn about two primary motivations for following the Lord. We're going to spend a little more time on one than the other, but both are important. Noted philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was uh, certainly not a man of Christian faith, but he had a cool mustache, and he said something that rings true. He said, and I quote, He who has a why in life can tolerate almost any how, unquote. That is to say, we we can bear almost any difficulty or hardship if we can see a good reason for it, or if we have a motivation to push through it. Well, in our text, Paul gives us reasons. He gives us the why that can get us through the how. And how life is these days is harder for many of us than it has been In recent years, the the pandemic has seemed to raise the baseline of our stress and add to that the gut-wrenching culture wars and the, the disorienting collapse of our new church home that has exiled us and the Christmas season that can be delightful but also stressful and depressing for some. Why go on? Why bother living for Jesus when the thought of doing one more thing beyond surviving sounds exhausting? Why make an effort to pursue the Lord when you feel like there's just nothing left in the tank? Why not just take the path of least resistance? Well, Paul begins to provide some answers to these questions in 2 Corinthians 5, 11, where he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. The main clause here is we persuade others. Paul is speaking primarily of his evangelistic efforts to persuade others concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's probably not the only thing he has in mind. After all, he's writing to the people in the church in Corinth, who for the most part are already believers. You may recall from previous studies that in the Corinthian church that that Paul himself started, he was accused by some of being ungodly, worldly, duplicitous, vacillating, dictatorial, and lacking the spiritual qualifications and authority to be an apostle. He was also accused of being bold in his letters, but a coward in person. Moreover, he was apparently criticized for not measuring up as a preacher. They whined that his sermons were not all that great. They griped that not as many people were being converted to Christ as one would expect from An apostle, surely a true apostle, would get more results, they thought. And to top it all, Paul was apparently not all that impressive to look at. Ancient sources suggest he was a small, frail man. His head was bald, his legs crooked, his eyebrows ran together, and his nose was hooked. And some might have secretly thought to themselves, No wonder he's single. 
all this was a problem in the Corinthian culture because the people, even the believers, admired attractive, eloquent, powerful speakers who could draw, captivate, and entertain a big audience. To Paul's critics, neither his person nor his performance was sufficiently impressive. So Paul found himself having to persuade some concerning the legitimacy of his apostleship. And so persuading others likely includes both Paul's evangelistic efforts to persuade unbelievers to believe in Jesus, and also Paul's efforts to persuade antagonists in the church and those swayed by them to believe in him as a true apostle of Jesus Christ. And this is raised as an important question. Why bother to persuade at all? <laughs> Evangelism is hard. Paul had been repeatedly rejected and persecuted and, and even physically assaulted for it. And dealing with antagonists in the church, that's also hard. Paul had been unjustly vilified by some Christian jerks. And how tempting it must have been just to blow it all off and return to tent making, return to Phariseeism where he had been successful and accepted. Why does he keep on trying to persuade when it's so hard? Well, one reason is fear. Paul mentions this in verse 11 when he says he persuades others, knowing the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord motivates him. Well, what exactly is the nature of this fear? Well, the first word of verse 11 gives us a clue. It's the word, therefore, and it points back to the immediately preceding context, specifically to verse 10, where you may recall Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The fear of God that motivates Paul is a healthy fear of one day standing before the judgment seat of Christ to be evaluated for what he has done as a believer on earth. Now, we've covered this lately, both in our study of 2 Corinthians and Obadiah. And it's worth repeating that this judgment of believers has nothing to do with gain or loss of eternal salvation. It has to do with gain or loss of rewards in heaven. Such fear of the Lord is a legitimate, biblical, God-ordained motivation to live a godly life to which God has called us as followers of Jesus. But in my own experience, the tenor and texture of this motivation varies among people and seems to be influenced to some extent by one's background and experiences. For example, uh, my wife Kathy grew up feeling unwanted and fearful much of the time. Her level of self-confidence and self-worth as a child was pretty low. Today, she certainly acknowledges and respects the judgment seat of Christ and the importance of rewards in the life of a believer. But because she felt she could not measure up as a child, she sometimes feels like she could never do enough to be rewarded by God. And so she's more readily, more naturally inspired by the second motivation we're going to cover in a few moments. And Kathy and I are different in this way. And I don't take this difference to be good or bad. She, she's no less godly than I am. I suspect people in the body of Christ simply differ as we do. And God provides multiple motivations that accommodate our differences. I say that to encourage you. We don't all have to be motivated in exactly the same way, uh, in exactly the same proportion. 
God sorts it out. He knows who we are as unique individuals. Proverbs 21.2 tells us the Lord weighs the heart. And I think Paul alludes to this idea in verse 11 of our text when he says, But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. Paul here is defending his integrity and the veracity of his apostleship. Paul speaks not on his own authority or out of selfish ambition. He speaks with the authority of an apostle in service to God. Paul says this is known to God, and he hopes that the Corinthians recognize it as well. But Paul is quick to head off any notion that he's bragging. In verse 12, he says, We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us. Now, in saying this, Paul is probably not admitting to commending himself previously. More likely, he's alluding to the fact that some antagonists in the Corinthian church had previously accused him of self-commendation and self-promotion. Paul is not boasting about himself. Rather, he's giving the Corinthians reason to stand up for him and for what is truly good in answer to his critics. Remember, Paul had been criticized and discredited for his unimpressive outward appearance. But Paul is here equipping the Corinthians to answer those critics, redirecting them to the importance of the heart. In the last part of verse 12, Paul explains that he's he's doing this so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Then in verse 13, Paul says something uh, rather poetic and powerful and a little humorous. He says, If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Now, the original Greek word translated beside ourselves means to be insane or to be out of one's mind or to be crazy. And so Paul says, hey, if we're crazy, we're crazy for God. On the other hand, if we're not crazy, if we're in our right mind, then it is for your benefit. It is for you. Either way, he is unselfish. And that's the point. Whether he's crazy or not, he's doing things for God and for others, not for himself. And doing things for God and for others is precisely the kind of craziness to which Christians are called. Which brings us right back to the questions posed at the beginning. Why bother? Why bother with such craziness? Why bother living for Jesus and the benefit of others when the thought of doing one more thing besides surviving sounds exhausting? Well, Paul has already given us one motivation, the fear of the Lord. Now, in verse 14, he gives us another saying, for the love of Christ controls us. From this, I glean the big idea of this sermon. The love of Christ controls us. And let's take a moment to reflect on what this means. The phrase, the love of Christ, can be taken in one of three ways. It can describe Um, our love for Christ, or it can describe Christ's love for us, or it can describe both. Scholars uh, generally favor Christ's love for us as the primary focus here, but this doesn't rule out our love for Christ and others as a consequence. As explained in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. I suspect Paul has in mind the entire 
causal sequence initiated by Christ's love for us. Christ first loved us as evidenced by his work on the cross. And because of this, we who have believed in Jesus respond by loving Christ and others. His love motivates us or controls us to love in response. The original Greek word translated controls is suneko. In our text, it means to constrain or to impel or to urge on. It carries both the idea of what to do and what not to do. We are at once compelled to love and we are constrained or restrained from self-seeking or self uh, selfish motives. And this leaves us with an important question. How do we allow ourselves to be controlled by the love of Christ? What if we're not feeling it? What is our part in this? Well, in verse 14, Paul begins to explain, saying, Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. The one who has died for all is Jesus. Uh, that is his great act of sacrificial love for us. And notice the consequence of Christ's love. Paul says, therefore, all have died. I take this to mean that those who have believed in Jesus have died to sin. Paul is alluding to our true identity in Christ. We are dead to sin and alive to God. And Paul is not just stating the reality of our identity in Christ. He's also saying that this is something that he thinks about. Notice in verse 14, he says, we have concluded this. He, he, he weighs it, turns it over in his mind, reminds himself, studies it, considers the implication. He keeps asking the question, what does Christ's love say about me? And we can join Paul in thinking through what Christ's love says about us. I am no longer shackled to sin. The price for my sin debt has been paid. My chains of sin have been broken. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am free from its bondage over me. Sin has no claim on me. I am dead to sin. I am alive to God. I am resurrected with Christ. I have been redeemed. I am free to serve God. I am perfectly acceptable in his sight. I have a new spiritual life and every spiritual blessing. I have been adopted forever into God's family as his child. A big part of allowing ourselves to be controlled by the love of Christ, is to come to these conclusions, not just once, but over and over again. These are all answers to the question, what does Christ's love say about me? We read scripture, we assemble together, we sing songs, we we hear teaching, we have fellowship, all to, uh, to keep learning and reminding ourselves of what Christ's love says about us. And that's a big part of allowing ourselves to be controlled by Christ's love. And there's another important part to this we are to ask ourselves another important question. What 
does Christ's love require of us? In verse 15, Paul answers the question, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, who for their sake died and was raised. What Christ's love requires of us is captured by the purpose clause, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. You and I are to live for Jesus, not for ourselves. For his agenda, not ours. For his glory, not ours. For his purposes, not ours. It is the love of Jesus for us that compelled him to die for us, that we might live. And it is his love that now compels us to no longer live for ourselves, but for him. Which brings us back to that big idea. The love of Christ controls us in every moment, in every decision, in every circumstance, we can allow the love of Christ to control us by asking ourselves, what does Christ's love say about me? And what does Christ's love require of me? The love of Christ controls us. I'd like to conclude this sermon in a a rather unusual way, at least unusual for us, I'd like to do it by um, giving you time to prayerfully reflect on some questions. Let me just go through the questions, and then I'll give you some time to to ponder. I'll leave the questions up on the, the screen. Here's the first question to ask yourself. Who or what is controlling me today? Who or what is controlling me today? Is it apathy or busyness or putting on a show or numbing the pain or fatigue or some false intimacy on a screen or getting ahead or pleasing people or just getting by, or shame, or looking for love in all the wrong places, or buying stuff to feel better, or feeling sorry for yourself, or putting up a front, or just surviving in quiet desperation. Whatever may be controlling you today, then ask yourself, The second question, what does Christ's love say about me? What does Christ's love say about me? Remind yourself that you don't have to be controlled by sin. You are dead to sin and alive to God. Come to that conclusion again. And then finally, Ask yourself a third question. What does Christ's love require of me? Right now, in the circumstances you face, in the relationships that you are in, in the difficulties that press in on you, what does love, uh, Christ's love require of me? Now, I'll leave these questions on the screen for you to ponder. Take your time uh, to prayerfully reflect on them, and in a few moments, I will return to wrap things up. 
Let's pray. Lord, compelled by your love for us, you died for all that we who live might no longer live for ourselves, but for you who died for our sake and rose again. May your love control us. Amen. moment you took everything that I own everything you've given from heaven above and everything that I've ever known if you stripped away my ministry my influence my reputation my health my happiness my friends my pride and my expectation if you cause for me to suffer or to suffer for the cause of the cross if the cost of my allegiance is prison and all my freedoms are lost if you take the